Well, hello again. It's good to be with everybody. I want to welcome you all to the final installment of our series, Hush Your Mouth. I hope that you have been challenged by this series. I've I've heard a lot of you uh, say to me that this has been a convicting series, that it's been a series that's made you think a lot. And of course, that's uh, the exact reason I chose to walk through this series. And if you've missed any of these messages, let's say this is your first week or you're just visiting with family because you're in town for Thanksgiving, you can listen to all the messages on our app or by going to our website or, uh, you know, a variety of different, uh, you know, places that... uh, Everything, wherever you watch your favorite podcast or anything, we're there. So you can catch up on anything that you missed. And uh, this series, Hush Your Mouth, is, has been about the reality of what we say, our speech, our tongue, has an impact on others, and it really is a reflection of who we are. And that as Christians, when we sign up to follow Jesus, you know, we are supposed to be a new creation. And that doesn't just mean uh, one part of our life. It means every part of our life. We are supposed to be completely different. So just because the world may uh, act a certain way or speak a certain way or say certain things, it doesn't mean that we should. In fact, if we are believers, if we are Christ followers, we should be a new creation and there should be some marked differences between the world and what comes out of their mouths and what comes out of our mouths. And so today, I'm going to talk to you about complaining. Not that any of you ever have done any of that, right? But complaining, and it just so happens to be along the lines of the week of Thanksgiving. So this is obviously, I think, an easy topic for us to discuss, but it might not be an easy uh, you know, topic for you to process through. Here, here's the reality about complaining. First of all, when we complain, you know, man, uh, it, it, it comes right out of our mouths. And uh, it's not easy to hush this part of the mouth. But as a whole, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we are probably more blessed as a whole, uh, as people on the planet right now. We've probably got it better and easier than any other person to have ever lived on the earth. And yet at the same time, we probably as a whole complain more as a group of people than any other group of people ever on the planet. Isn't that interesting that those things kind of work at the same time? We, we complain about all kinds of stuff. In, in our kind of spoiledness, we, we complain about slow Wi-Fi. Think about that for a moment. We complain that, man, it takes forever for us to be able to get to any piece of information that ever existed, right? That, that's kind of interesting. Uh, we complain about long lines and drive throughs right? We've got to wait like 15 minutes for someone to hand us food, right? It's all prepared. Uh, we, we complain about the weather, We're able to look at an app and know what the weather is going to be for the next week, and we complain about that. Uh, People complain about having to work 45-hour work weeks, which I think is a unique kind of situation. We complain about having to get up early the next morning. That's a favorite thing to complain about for some people. And so it's just interesting. You know, we're so blessed, and yet we we all complain about so many different things. Um, Actually, I came across you know, uh, some crazy complaints that vacationers made and actually submitted and turned in in various forms in different situations. You would think when a person's like on a retreat or on a vacation that the last thing that they would do is complain. But, but here are three honest, true, I didn't make these up, complaints that came in. The first one is a, a hotel complaint. It was turned into the hotel and here's what it said. The beach was too sandy. We had to clean everything when we returned to our room. Well, yeah, that, that is probably a reality. I'm just not sure that's something that you need to complain to the hotel about. Here's one uh, on a cruise. Uh, we had to line up outside to catch the boat, and there was no air conditioning. I mean... Can you believe it? They didn't provide air conditioning outside as people lined up to get on the boat. 
And yet somebody felt the need to send that one. In. Here's another one. Uh, this is a resort. Uh, the roads were uneven and bumpy. So we couldn't read the local guidebook during the bus ride to the resort. And because of this, we were unaware of many things that would have made our holiday more fun. Can, can you imagine being on vacation and needing to turn that complaint in? It's like, oh my gosh, it, we were, you know, on an island and the roads were developed enough. And, uh, you know, we need to write and complain about this. And yet that's how uh, people have become these days. Now, one person shot back at a complainer. And, and I don't know that we should enjoy this as much as I do, but, but I'm going to share this uh, story with you. I came across this on, on Twitter. And so um, let, let's pull this up. Now, you're not going to be able to read it. I'll, I'll read it to you here in just a second. But uh, I blocked out the person's name and everything. But here it says, good evening to everyone except the woman at my co-op who complained to the board about me and my toddler using sidewalk chalk in the courtyard. So uh, I wrote her a little letter in sidewalk chalk in the courtyard. Okay, so if you look at this picture, this is a close-up of the text, uh, uh, just the text. This is an actual shot of in front of the building and uh, let me just read to you the, the beginning line and the closing line. It's too long for me to read the whole thing, but th this woman wrote, um, this will be my last time using sidewalk chalk in the courtyard since it seems to be such a problem for you. Remember, this is written in public on the boardwalk going into the apartment. I'm sorry that harmless fun that brought my toddler joy causes you so much distress that you had to complain to the co-op board. And then she goes on to explain a lot of details about uh, this happening during COVID and her child had nowhere to go. And uh, so she thought this was one option for him to get fresh air. And she, she wraps up the, the message by saying, I hope that every time it rains, Rain that would have washed away any colorful ABCs that my child wrote on the ground. I hope that you think of me. And, and, and you know, I know we probably shouldn't enjoy that that much, but I mean, that's a shot back at someone who felt the need to write a complaint out and turn it in because some child had, you know, played on the sidewalk and, and, and maybe they didn't want to look at that. Now, in all seriousness, constant complaining uh, can become a real, real problem. It can become a real problem. And, and if we don't watch it, uh, we will look just like the world and there will be no reflection of Christ in our lives. It's certainly an area that Christians need to hush their mouth on. And so like we've talked about with uh, lying and gossip and, and, and now complaining, we're gonna jump into this topic. Now, one psychologist ha has stated that there, there are a couple of different types of complainers. And I wanna read to you these, and I don't want you to elbow anybody in your family. I don't want you to like peg, oh, this is you, uh, you know, and then you, you kind of send that message. This is for you to evaluate where do you fall in this set of types because you're gonna probably fall into one of these types, okay? So this, a self-evaluation here for a moment. The first type is the whiner, okay? One type of complainer is the whiner. Um, life uh, isn't fair to the whiner. They're always complaining that life isn't fair. Why can't things just go my way, right? So some people just kind of whine and complain about everything because it seems like nothing will go their way. Uh, here's the second one, the martyr. The martyr complains this way. Uh, nobody appreciates me. Nobody, and I already hear some people saying some stuff, so just pro, this is internal processing, right? No, no one appreciates me. I do all the work. Nobody works as hard as me. No one is helping as much as me. And they just complain all the time. That's the martyr. How about the cynic? The cynic believes the worst is always going to happen. Things will never get better than what they are right now. The sky is always falling. And so they complain in that manner. How about the perfectionist? The perfectionist is never satisfied. Nothing is ever good enough. This person finds fault in everything. Are you that complainer? Or, or how about this one? The, the negative Nelly or negative Ned, right? Let's, let's, let's make it equal here. 
Negative Nelly. Now this one's close to the cynic, but a little bit different, right? Because I feel like with the negative Nelly, it's just like the, this person almost just enjoys negativity all the time. Like everything is negative no matter what. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. They're just negative, negative, negative. And when you call that person out, they say defensively, I'm not being negative. I'm just, I'm just being honest. But really, they're just never happy, and they're always negative. Now, that's just five broad types of complainers. Now, my question is, do you clearly fall in one of those types? I, I bet you do. Uh, maybe you fall into more than just one category. Again, it's not about uh, who does your, uh, where, where does your spouse land, or where does your parents land, or where does your child land? It's where do you land? You see, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, this will be kind of our foundational verse for today, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 and 18, he says the following, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now let's just look at that verse for a second because this is really a charge to you as a believer in Jesus Christ. As a born again Christian, you are supposed to hear this charge and live this out in your life. And it's the opposite of complaining. You'll notice there's like three things, like a three point sermon right there for you. First of all, rejoice always. You know, you should be positive. You should be happy. Really, despite you know, what's right in front of you, there is a reason to rejoice and uh, pray continually. That means don't just complain continually, but talk to God. Talk to the one who can solve problems. Talk to the one that knows your heart. Talk to the one who's in control. Share with him. Don't just complain, but pray continually. That means all the time. And then give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks, that means even when things aren't going well, you can rejoice and you can also be thankful because a Christian ha has a, has a 30,000 foot you know, view, more of a bird's eye view rather than just a temporary in the moment view. If you are born again, a new creation in Christ, you're, you're able to know that God is in control. You don't know everything and how it's gonna go and, and you know that in scripture, God's word teaches us that through difficult times, we actually are being, you know, formed and polished and, and given strength and we're learning new things and we should see even difficult circumstances as opportunities for growth. And so we have a different view than the world. We don't simply open our mouth and complain, 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 complain all the time. We have a spirit of rejoicing, of prayer, and of thanksgiving. You see, that's the way it's supposed to be. But often, a critical spirit, a complainer will have a critical spirit. And a critical spirit is an indication of a heart problem. This is the big, uh, the big theme for this whole series, that, that what comes out of our mouth isn't necessarily the problem. It, it's, it's what's heard, it's what's said, it's what's talked about, but, but actually there is a root problem to everything that comes out of the mouth. If you lie, there's something else going on. If you gossip, there's something else going on. If you complain, there is something else going on and it's going on where? In the heart. Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You don't say something just randomly. You always say something as a result of something going on in your heart. And so in each of the topics that we've talked about in this series, we've been trying to peel back the layers and say, okay, you know, this issue is bad when it comes out of our mouth, but why would this come out of our mouth? Let's go deep and look at the heart and discover if we can figure out what is the root problem. So that's what we're gonna do today with complaining. If you find yourself complaining too much, maybe you now know what type of complainer you are, but let's talk about five potential heart problems that need to be fixed 
so that you can actually hush your mouth. So if you're taking notes today, I want you to jot each of these down. The, the first potential problem is this. A lack of contentment leads to complaining. A lack of contentment leads to complaining. The desire for more, for better, for newer is a breeding ground for complaining. It's just literally a breeding ground. If, if you are a person that cannot be content with what you have and you need the newest, the best, the greatest, well, you're going to find yourself complaining all the time. So if, if, if you've got, uh, you know, your iPhone is, is like on eight or you're at 10 or whatever the numbers are these days and you're like, you know, that's not good enough and you're not content with uh, what you've got, you're gonna be like this with your phone. Oh, have you seen the new phones? They've got you know, special cameras on them. The pictures are way better. This phone can't take good pictures. I hate this phone, right? If you're not content with what you have, you might say, look at this. Look at all these cracks on this thing. I've had this thing forever. I, I deserve a new phone. I need a new phone, right? Or maybe it's your car, right? I, I want the heated seats. I want the shiny wheels. I want the better gas mileage. If you are not a person who is content but you need more and enough is never enough, man, you are always gonna have an opportunity to complain. It's the natural byproduct of someone who isn't content. In 1 Timothy, Paul writes, he's giving advice to Timothy, chapter six, verses six through eight, Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. No, notice that the first part of that, godliness, we know what that is. I mean, to, to walk with God, to, to be a one with God, to be righteous, to be pure. Obviously, that's a great thing. But, but that, along with contentment, is great gain. What does that mean? It means, man, man, you will be sitting pretty if you can make sure you know who you are in relationship to God and also make sure that you find a place where you are content with what you have. And there's a freedom that comes from learning to be satisfied. The lost art of being satisfied, of knowing when enough is enough. And when we learn to embrace enough, we will radically change the number of complaints that come out of our mouth. And let me tell you, there is a freedom. You know, the, you know that freedom you experience when you gave your life to Christ and you realized you were bought for a price and you received grace and you're gonna live for eternity and you're now free in Christ, no longer in bondage? Well, that's an awesome feeling. It's, a, it's another awesome freedom feeling when you get to the place where you are content because then you just have what you need and you're not always thinking about what you want or what you think you might need and it offers you freedom. Now, that's the, the first potential problem. That might not be your problem, right? You got complaints coming out of your mouth and, and that might not be it, but it could be it. So peel back the layers and look at your heart. Now, the, the second possibility of a, of a heart problem is a lack of humility. A lack of humility also leads to complaining. You know, when we think we are better than others, we focus on ourselves. When we're all focused on just ourselves, uh, we believe that we deserve certain things. This is a process, right? And then when we don't get those things that we deserve because we're only focused on ourselves, guess what we do? We start complaining. We, we start complaining. When we are arrogant and entitled, there are lots of things to complain about. Now, Paul also writes in Philippians, it's a, it's a famous passage in Philippians in chapter two, where, where Paul talks about Christ and he highlights the humility of Christ. In fact, he kind of puts this big umbrella of like, just think about this. He says, Jesus was in heaven, but he did not consider equality with God something to be held on to. You may have grown up with, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But instead, he let that go and he left heaven and he came to earth and he took on the form of a man. The son of God did this. 
came here when he didn't have to, took on this when he didn't have to. And he walked around, he lived his life and went to the cross and died as a servant, serving mankind. That's the picture painted in Philippians 2 by Paul. So after Paul explains how humble Christ was to come and die for us when he was God, he then says in Philippians 2 verse 14, directly after that description of Jesus, so now you all as Christians do everything without grumbling or arguing. It's the first thing he says after describing the humility of Christ. You all should do everything without grumbling or or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Everybody in the world might complain, but man, if you are becoming like Christ, you are going to be different. You're going to embrace humility. And listen, when we learn to imitate Christ's humility and put the needs of others before our own, guess what? Our complaints start to seem pretty petty and insignificant, and we back off of them. I mean, the moment you back off of thinking you're all that in a bag of chips, and you deserve, you deserve, you deserve, and you go, wait a minute, God humbled himself and died for me, and he was God and perfect. I'm not perfect. I've received grace. I don't deserve any of this. I'm so thankful. Um, I'm gonna embrace humility like Christ. You don't walk around thinking, you know, this better be this way or I gotta have this or I can't believe the sand is in my shoe on vacation. You know, you don't even think that way because there is humility present. So if complaints come out of your mouth all the time, it might be the heart problem of humility. Number three, a lack of trust might be the problem because a lack of trust leads to complaining. What kind of trust am I talking about? I'm talking about trust in God. Who? Trust God. Man, when we lack trust in God, it leads to complaining. Here's how this works. When life and circumstances don't go your way, and if it hasn't ever happened to you, it will happen to you. you, you you've got this process that begins to take place. For example, uh, you don't get that job that you were really hoping to get promoted to. Um, your investments are tanking. They're not going up and to the right like you were hoping they would. Your kid doesn't make it on the team. And uh, so there you have these circumstances that you don't like. Things haven't gone your way. And so you start to process through those frustrations. And as you begin to process through the frustrations, you begin to voice complaints. Man, I can't believe Bob got that job. I've been here five years longer. I, well, I can't believe, you know, I lost this much money. I thought you knew what you were doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, maybe I need to find somebody that can, you know, invest my money better. And so, you know, you have conflict with somebody and you kind of complain and just, you know, fly off the handle to them. Or, you know, your kid didn't make the team and it's because the coach is best friends with all these other parents and you're not gonna play that game and all the other kids aren't nearly as good as your kid. And, and just because you won't play the game, your kid's sitting on the bench and you just, you know, all that complaining starts to come out. Whatever your scenario is, this happens to all of us. But can I tell you, when you start complaining out of your mouth about all the circumstances in your life, in a way, you're not just complaining about the events or the situation. You're actually grumbling against God. Now, this might sound strange to you, and you might want a knee-jerk reaction and say, no, that's not what I'm doing. I'm complaining about the jerk coach who won't play my kid. No, actually, you're grumbling against God. It's like you're saying, God, I, I gave you my life. I want you to lead my life, to be the Lord and Savior of my life, and uh, I thought you were gonna, you know, lay out a path for me and all these things aren't going my way and I'm complaining about it. It's like you're saying, hey God, you don't know what you're doing or you wouldn't have me in this situation. It's kind of like you're saying, you must not believe, uh, or it's like you're saying, God, you must not have the, my best interest in mind or, 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 or my investments would be going up and to the right or I would have gotten that promotion. Clearly there's something wrong here. 
And you might say, I, I, I don't, I, that seems to be a, a bit of a stretch. I mean, am I really grumbling against God if I, I don't even mean to be and I'm just actually complaining about this, you know, bad circumstance in my life? Well, uh, let me kind of take you to a quick story where that exactly happened in scripture. Um, when, when the Israelites were freed from Egypt and uh, they were wandering in the desert, they came to a point where they began to complain and grumble about their eating arrangements. Uh, th they were very concerned about how, you know, dinner time was going to go. And so in Exodus chapter 16, verses two and three, here's what it says. In the desert, the whole community, the community of Israel, grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron were the ones leading Israel at that time. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and we ate all the food we wanted, but you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Now that's a complaint right there. It's pretty dramatic too, right? You brought us out here, so we all are gonna starve to death as if there wasn't actually a plan. You, you see the lack of trust here? And what's interesting is what Moses says in response to their grumbling. If you jump down to verse eight, and it's gonna also come up on the screen, Moses says back to them, you're not grumbling against us, but against God. So that's not just a little theory of mine that I threw in there for fun, it's, it's a precedent. These folks were complaining about their eating arrangements and Moses immediately corrected them and said, you know, you're not, you're not complaining against me and Aaron here. We're not running the show. God just set us free from 400 years of slavery and you would think that you would trust that he might have worked out dinner, but you haven't. And so by complaining against us, you're actually grumbling against God. Do you not realize that God is always in control? And they weren't realizing that. They didn't trust God. So they complain. The first time their stomach growled and they didn't know how things were gonna go down, they start complaining about, hey, we used to have pots of meat. We could eat all we wanted. What they didn't know was God, this is right in the section where God is about to make Bread fall from the sky and meat in the form of quail fall from the sky at morning and night where they didn't have to do anything but go out and trust that God every day would feed them, which he would, you know, for the next 40 years. But they didn't know that. Not yet because they were complaining and they weren't trusting God. And so the circumstances in front of them well, they didn't hush their mouth, they just let it roll on out. And so we've got to be careful that when we face certain things in life that we don't automatically go to complaining because it is a message to God saying that, hey, you know, we don't trust you to, to provide and lead our lives in such a way that, 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 that we can just exist and pray and be rejoiceful and thankful in this moment. No, we're, we're gonna complain. And I, I think if you were in God's shoe, put it this way, have you ever been a parent on the other end of this, right? and you had a kid kind of not believe that you had their best interest in mind and they didn't trust you, and you're like, what do I have to do? Boy, I provide you a place to sleep. You know that whole little thing that you do as a parent? Well, that's what God is thinking about you when you walk around all day long complaining about your circumstances as if he's not fully involved and trustworthy enough. And so, be careful. Uh, if it's coming out of your mouth, it might be that heart problem. But if it's not uh, trust or humility or contentment, um, it might be a lack of counting. A lack of counting can lead to complaining. Now, this isn't like you know, a math issue here. We're talking about counting your blessings. A lack of counting your blessings can lead to complaining. Now, this one's probably the most obvious and known situation uh, that we're going to discuss, but it's very true. Complaining is almost always a direct result of forgetting all the good things that you have to be thankful for. I mean, literally, uh, you take so many blessings 
for granted. I take so many blessings for granted. And if every single time we, we just didn't complain, if we stopped the complaining and actually processed through all the things that are actually going our way, we would really probably complain less, but people don't do that. In fact, Israel was a case study of this. I mean, this was their major problem. Very close to what we just talked about on the trust topic, um, Israel grumbled and complained about food. They grumbled and complained when they first were you know, freed from slavery. They got locked into a dead end or what they thought was a dead end when uh, you know, Egypt was that way and over here was the Red Sea and there was no way to get across and then they heard that the chariots were coming after them. They complained and grumbled there, said the same thing. What, you brought us out here to die? You know, and then later they would say, you brought us out here to starve to death? And then, of course, when they eventually would get to the promised land, uh, they're like, you brought us here to try to take land from these people who are bigger than us? I mean, these people have armies. I mean, it just never stopped with Israel. In fact, Psalm 106, which I don't have time to read to you, but you ought to read it this week, but Psalm 106 highlights four different occasions where Israel grumbled and complained. Let me just read you one verse from Psalm 106. Remember, this would be written potentially by David or somebody else, but it is long after that part of history. And the psalmist is looking back at the time when it says Egypt, referring to the, that generation that was set free. So it says this, when our ancestors were in Egypt, not literally in Egypt, but the ancestors that started in Egypt and were freed, they gave no thought to your miracles, God. They did not remember your many kindnesses and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. They were referring to uh, that moment when it's like, we, we can't get across. They didn't trust God. They, they didn't know God was about to part the Red Sea for them, but they also didn't count their blessings. Like, why didn't someone go, wait a minute, yeah, this is an awkward situation we find ourselves in but it's better than being enslaved for 420 years, generational enslavement. Uh, at least, you know, someone might survive whatever's about to happen and they'll have a better life. And oh, by the way, um, the creator of the universe miraculously set us free so that we could walk out of Egypt and the Egyptians were handing us their gold just to get us out of there because of the plague. So we're walking out, not just free, but rich, and uh, we now have a God that wants to be our father and our leader, and he's gonna lead us into a promised land. I mean, like, why didn't somebody at the Red Sea, before they started grumbling, go, man, we got a lot to be thankful for? Well, because they're humans. I mean, Israel gets picked on all the time, but the reason Israel is even, uh, a record of Israel is given to us in the Bible is for the very reason that we are going to be just like them and we need to learn from their mistakes. And so, you know, we've got to count our blessings. This happened to me this week. So my daughter came home and um, unexpectedly, you know, she needs uh, her car looked at. There's something wrong with her car. So, you know, you know, if you have a college student, you know how that is, parents, right? So the, she comes home and it's like, oh, okay, she needs new tires. So quickly went from, you know, didn't need to spend any money to, I got to spend like five, six, seven hundred bucks on tires. So then, you know, like nobody's open. It's kind of a, you know, holiday time. So get her car in the place and then find out the, the reasons the tires are so, you know, worn unevenly uh, is because the shocks are bad. So now it's, you got to put the shocks on um, and, and the tires. So I, I'm in for, you know, 980 bucks. Boom. Well, that wasn't really fun. So, but you know, you got to do it. So uh, I, I do that. She's all taken care of. And then we get half Thanksgiving, just one day. And then she's going to head back. And I'm so glad that she gets to be able to head back. And I've been able to take care of this as her father. She goes out to get in her car and in the driveway, her tire's flat. Right. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. So, so then, you know, I, I tell her to pour water on it, soapy water, and she sees it's coming out of the stem. And so I'm like, you know, no, the, the person that did the, the, the place that did the tires, they weren't open. And uh, so now I'm gonna have to find a place that's open to 
to pay for something that, that should be free, that should be, right? So I, you know, I had to get up at like seven in the morning on Friday or Saturday morning, Saturday morning, yesterday, and, you know, sit in a waiting room and have, you know, and then I paid like $100 for a stem issue on the tire that probably could have been, should have been fixed for free, all that. And I have lots of opportunities to go, this is not how I want to spend my day, not how I want to spend my money, which is par for the course, you know, when you have car problems. And I could have gone down that road and really uh, voiced all these complaints. But you know what uh, thought jumped actually into my mind was my daughter is in her final semester of her master's program and she's done with school, praise the Lord. And uh, she had bought this car when she was 16 years old. And so she's been driving that she's 22 This car has lasted from 16 to 22, no major problems. She's gone back and forth to school dozens and dozens of times with no problems at all. She's never been in any accident. She's not been hit by a drunk driver. And so I gotta pay, you know, 900 bucks every once in a while for normal wear and tear on a car. And I lose a a few hours, one more. Is that really something I need to be complaining about? Or do I need to count my blessings that my daughter has been safe for a long, long time. It's that fast, right? Like you can step into it or you can step out of it. And so you've got to decide, man, is your, is your problem a hard issue of counting or, 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 or is it something else? Well, there's only one more thing it could possibly be. And maybe actually, I, I don't know that I have a complete list here, but I got five things because it would fit in my time slot. So here's the fifth and final potential problem that you might be dealing with if you can't hush your mouth when it comes to complaining. And that is a lack of spirit can lead to complaining. A lack of spirit. Now, what I mean by that is, is Holy Spirit. A lack of the Holy Spirit in your life will certainly lead to complaining. You see, complaining and the critical spirit that accompanies it is the opposite of the fruit of the spirit. So when you are a complainer, when it's constantly coming out of your mouth, this isn't fair, or nobody is you know, working as hard as me, or it shouldn't be this way, or can you believe how bad that is, or how old this is, when that complaining is always coming out of your mouth, man, that is the opposite of what would come out of your mouth if the Spirit was active in your life. If you were walking with the Spirit and growing in the Spirit, diving into God's Word, asking God to invade your heart and and giving free reign to the Spirit, staying in step with the Spirit, if you were walking with the Spirit of God, you would have the opposite come out. Because when, when you are complaining, guess what? That keeps you from living a life of peace, of joy, of patience. And those are the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, and self-control. In other words, this is what is produced out of the person who's in step with the Spirit. It naturally comes out of the mouth because it's what's in the heart. Jesus says it in so many different ways. He says that, uh, you know, a, a, a fig tree, right, is gonna produce something. A thorn bush is gonna produce something. A thorn bush isn't gonna produce a fig, right? A fig is only gonna come from a fig tree. Um, he, he talks about it in uh, water and springs. He's like, you know, when there's a spring, like I've got a natural, you know, uh, spring on my property that water just flows out of. You know what doesn't flow out of it? Brackish water. When I lived in Savannah, um, I lived right near a river that was brackish. It was fresh water uh, and it was ocean water that would mix. Um, If you go to the ocean, you're gonna get salt water. You, You can't expect something that's not in that thing to come out of that thing. And that's what Jesus wants us to understand that like it's in your heart. What comes out of your heart is what is in you. And so if what's in you is only complaining, well, then the fruit of the spirit isn't in you. Because if you are in step with the spirit, it will come out of you naturally. 
And the only way that exchange happens is by you surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. That's why I've said through this whole series, if you wanna stop lying, if you wanna stop gossiping, if you wanna stop complaining, go spend time with Jesus, read his word and pray to him and talk with him and the spirit will do something in you far more effective than you just trying to be more careful not to cuss or more careful not to lie or more careful with your tongue not to you know, insult somebody or not gossip or not complain. That's a, a temporary and a narrow focus on the wrong thing. Man, you might be lacking the spirit. The only way that you have the spirit at work in your life is for you to let him in. So some of you today might be visiting and you're not believers. You don't walk with the Lord. You never made Jesus your Lord and Savior. I'm telling you, man, you are never going to be able to hush your mouth until you have a new heart. And a new heart comes only from Christ. And one last thing I'll say about this point. It is so unattractive to the watching world of unbelievers when we as Christians lack the spirit and we continue to complain. When they look at that, just think about that. Uh, They're looking at you and you're claiming to be a Christian, but all they see is you whining and complaining about every circumstance in your life. You know what they're thinking. They're thinking, well, if that's what they get from doing what they do and walking with their God, why would I want anything to do with their God? And so you don't even realize it, but, but your critical spirit, if not checked and not changed by the Holy Spirit, will, will negatively affect an unbelieving, watching world. We want to give them something better. We want them to see the goodness come out of us. We want people to see thanksgiving, right, in all circumstances, rejoicing in all circumstances, and a life of prayer in all circumstances. If they see that rather than complaining, man, we will have done our job of being a light in this world. And so, is it possible to complain and to be uh, upset and bothered by something and voice that concern and it not be a sin? Is that possible? Absolutely, right? Like if you go to the mechanic and you know you pay money to get your car fixed and then you know you're driving out of the lot and all four of your wheels fall off because they forgot to put the lug nuts on. Like, you know, it is not a sin to go, well, gee, now that's a concern. Um, could you please put the wheels back on? I, I need the wheels on, right? That's not sin, right? There is a big difference between pointing out and, and letting people know and, and, and addressing problems and a critical, complaining, grumbling spirit. And I think you know the difference between the two. And so my prayer is that as we wrap up this series, with this topic as with all the others, you will invite Jesus into your heart to change you. And I know that some of you uh, have looked at yourselves and you said, this has been very convicting, this series. It's supposed to be convicting. And you're right where God wants you to be. And you're one step away from saying, God, I I recognize it. Now help me be better. And you will be better. I'm telling you from experience, you will be dumbfounded. If you are faithful to the Lord, you'll be able to look back on your life with each and every year and go, I am not the person I used to be and I don't say the things I used to say and I don't talk the way I used to talk and I don't use the tone that I used to use. I I, I don't gossip anymore. I don't complain. Are you gonna nip it all in the bud perfectly and be perfect? No, but you will make great strides by the power of the Holy Spirit and you will become sanctified into that new creation here on earth and uh, I, I just can't wait for that to happen in your life. It's, it's what I'm trying to make happen in my life too. And so we do this journey together. So with that, let me wrap it up with a prayer. Father, thank you so much for this uh, holiday weekend. We're so thankful for all the ways that you've blessed us. And we're thankful for the time with our families. And, and we lift up those who, who had difficult uh, holidays because uh, maybe this was the first uh, that they had without a family member. And Father, we just... We're just so thankful that your word is, is alive and active and that as we've walked through this topic uh, over the last four weeks, you, you've been able to speak to our hearts 
We want you to change them. We invite you in. We love you, Father. It's in your son's name that we pray. Everybody says, amen. God bless you guys. Have another great day.